<laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Iron Circus Geek Show um, without a spike. Uh, I'm Kel. I'm Amanda. And we have a guest this week because we are closing out the crowdfund for failure to launch. What's up, fools? I'm Blue. Good to heat Hi, see you. Blue. <laughs> Blue, please explain your icon. You said that you'd explain it on air once we started the show. Oh, yeah. Ha happy to. So, okay. So, all of the uh, avatars for this more or less have been circus themed, right? Yes. So when I was a kid, my mom did not take me to uh, traditional circuses because she did not believe in animal performers. She thought that was animal cruelty. So instead, the circus that we would go to was Canada's uh, finest Cirque du Soleil. And there are many a very funky Cirque du Soleil soundtrack that still lives in my head to this day. And there is a show that I remember... Um, I, I tracked it down. I think it was from like 1996, 97, this show called Kidom that uh, all of the Cirque du Soleil shows have like a story, right? Like there's kind of a storyline around which people do tricks. And the storyline involved like a girl who was falling around a headless guy, like a guy with no head and an umbrella who like walked around Rene Magritte style through the stage and also the audience. And that was like the, the mascot of this show. So when I think circus, I think headless French Canadians. Okay. That checks out. Yeah. By the way, I like listen to some of these like mid nineties, uh, Cirque du Soleil soundtracks. They slap, they still slap in that kind of I, like, I have never actually seen Cirque du Soleil. They're Me fun. Neither. Um, I, I went down kind of a rabbit hole when I was like working on the icon yesterday, uh, back when the <coughs> pandemic just started, cause Cirque du Soleil still tours. They do uh, stuff in Las Vegas all the time, but they tour all around the world. Uh, when the pandemic started, they did one of those like video super cuts of some of their shows in a, mm -hmm. you know, we'll, we'll all get through this, this trying time together. So enjoy our show. And uh, yeah, they're they're fun. I watched uh, two guys go around on this thing called a, a Wheel of Death, um, that was frankly extremely impressive. I'll I'll link some uh, some links to y'all later. But yeah, if you ever want like some some mid '90s uh, slap bass like fighting <laughs> music, I strongly recommend uh, Cirque du Soleil soundtracks. Good, good, good. And this thing called uh, a, a oh no. I didn't mute the video. Ignore me. Sorry. Okay, if I get quiet, Spike asked me to take, because Spike is not well, that's why she's not here. She asked me to take over the Iron Circus Twitter account to help um, promote failure to launch in its final hours. Um, so if I get quiet, it's because I'm um, attention span problems and me going, uh, okay. uh, f uh um, help. Well, Blue, why don't you tell the audience what um, your failure to launch story is about? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so my story is about everyone's favorite uh, space colony design, the O'Neill Cylinder, which if you have watched a Gundam or if you have uh, <coughs> looked at any uh, futurism books from the 60s, you've probably seen it's like a cylindrical shaped structure where the inside is fully like layered with residential uh, blocks and industrial blocks. And there's usually skylights and fake rivers and things like that. And it was, um, it was uh, pioneered by this futurist named, I believe Gerard O'Neill. Um, and he was kind of a uh, proponent of going into space, uh, creating colonies in space in a attempt to escape what was kind of the bugbear of the 60s, which was impending overpopulation. And so I was really intrigued by the idea of touring an O'Neill cylinder and having it be described as someone in <laughs> the problems it was designed to solve. And even though it's kind of a hypothetical concept, obviously an O'Neill cylinder has never been built. Um, it is really... It was really interesting to research and re like read these futures and books from the 60s and 70s and like re-examine it again because I don't know if overpopulation is quite the problem that we deal with at this point. <laughs> it was very scary to people 50 years ago. 
Um, that one, like, the idea is that it spins so, like, um, that is creating the gravity with centripetal force. Is that mm -hmm. the idea behind its ring? I believe so. Yeah, I'm trying to remember all the physics of it specifically, but yes, I think it rotates on an axis that, like, cuts through <laughs> the length of the structure to yeah. have everybody like sit along the sideline but the would it the, be easier to spin in space i guess it'd be you wouldn't need as much force to spin in space would you i believe so yes. yeah would and you i think be able to spin fast enough to make or the correct speed to make gravity that matches earth's gravity i mean would I it have like to match more? earth's or just be pretty close um that's a good question i mean i guess it doesn't necessarily have to perfectly match earth's gravity if i'm remembering correctly the theory was that if we positioned one at some of the Lagrange points of, you know, Earth to the sun or Earth to the moon, that would, like, help kick <clears throat> it along. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, the thing that I remember uh, I was both really intrigued by, but also gave me a lot of, you know, stress trying to figure out how to render, is the internal curve and how that looks for someone being inside it. Because this thing is, like, curved. Yeah up and inward in kind of the opposite way that the earth is so there's no horizon obviously and you're always like if you are walking yeah, you're always looking uh, at the I floor guess. ahead of you yeah and and it, it's a, it's a tube so like if you go along like lengthwise then it's flat but if you go horizontally along the tube at all you are constantly going uphill no matter which way you go and i end up doing some like math like i literally sat down with some graph paper and did some math and some geometry trying to figure out how steep that incline would be. And it is like equivalent to some like <gasps> inclines that you would be familiar with. Like New Zealand, there's a there's a town in New Zealand, I think it's Dunedin, that is like basically hills upon hills upon hills. Downtown San Francisco is also pretty close. Interesting. Um so yeah, if you think about like steeper than the incline the homes, I drug my suitcase up at yes. Emerald City. No! Oh, God. The, the one where you're constantly no! going uphill no matter where you go. No! Yeah. Steeper than that. Okay, the gravity would have to be lessened. That I think would probably be, the, make the, it life easier. Yes. Yeah, the gravity would have to be less than Earth to make that, like, <laughs> not hell. <laughs> Imagine, like, our humans just get really strong. We're just really strong and great at inclines. Yeah, we got those like we got those legs. We got those like calf oh, no. muscles. Uh, that I, are just... I will be right back. My tummy is doing a thing. I'm so sorry. Okay. You two have to hold the show. I'll be right back. Yeah. You gotta have those we like triplets of Belleville. Muscles. Triplets we of Belleville just... style. Yeah. Um <laughs> Yeah, no, that was that was pretty fun and I probably put more, you know napkin math into it than i necessarily had to but i was genuinely intrigued there is a shot where i was like drawing someone looking up or down as you have it uh an incline at one of the main characters and trying to figure out how to make <coughs> that work was was fun um i also like the the most famous illustrations showing an o'neill cylinder are by this um futurist illustrator named rick I'm going to take a stab at his last name, Guidice. Um, He is a mm -hmm. very, like, he's like a traditional painter, and he has, like, this very distinct style that I tried to cop for the comic. How well I did uh, is is up to you. But, um, yeah, it's just, like, lots of really rich, groovy colors, just, like, really, really vibrant, like, greens and, and purples and pinks. Uh, and... I even, like, when I was designing the main characters, I tried to go for, like, a 70s look. The main the fe main female character is very, very clearly inspired by Karen Allen um, mm -hmm. from Indiana Jones, but I was looking at a, uh, the movie I just watched when I was designing her was Starman with uh, Jeff Bridges. I think that was Jeff Bridges. She's got that kind of, like, late 70s kind of hair flip thing that she's doing. Yeah. And I the, think like, the feathering, I think, is what it's yeah. called. Um, yeah, where it's all it's all feathered out and makes like the the surface area of the head bigger. I want to say the main male character kind of was based on Lakeith Stanfield, but I put him in like some seventies outfits. It's like the it's like the seventies fabric where it looks like it cracks when you move around in it. Yeah, it crunches. 
Um, we got people in chat talking about um, our good friend Kristen Cheney saying um, Stonewall Green was about overpopulation anxiety. Um, yeah. And then uh, Lily is uh, in the chat is saying um, overpopulation anxiety back then seems overblown in stories from a certain vintage. Uh, and the H Bomber guy says, OMG Blue. Um, oh, hi. So. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I'm not an I'm not an expert in the like the history of this. If I'm remembering correctly, what basically happened between the 70s and now uh, that kind of made the overpopulation thing become <clears throat> less of a crisis is that we became much, much more efficient at harvesting food crops, or at least like we were yeah, able now, to engineer them in a way that they were like food. Yeah, like, yeah, we throw away a whole bunch and just like what we are able to cultivate and grow is just more nutritious and more efficient. So it wasn't nearly, we don't nearly face that crisis anymore. Instead, we have a whole bunch of other ones instead. Yeah, we just have capitalism. Um, yeah. Oh, hey, Nero. I can see that. We got, I got we all have my, my friends in the chat. All friends in the chat. Um... Blue, I started to tell you about this before we went live, um, but I feel the need to tell you about the movie Cursed, starring oh, Christina please. Ricci, which do. is not a good movie. Um, Lily in the chat was is in my uh, fan Discord and did join for watching this absolutely ridiculous movie, um, which uh, I have basically in it, they have werewolfism also gets spread via sex. So... When you become a werewolf, everyone wants to fuck you. Like, literally, uh, one of the key things is, like, as soon as Christina Ricci becomes a werewolf, she starts getting hit on by, like, every dude she runs into. Um, is it, like, a pheromone her, thing? I They never explain it. They just say that, like, people want to fuck you. Um, uh, I'm back. I'm like, so sorry. Um... <laughs> Uh, My guts I'm are revolting about... in both definitions of the word. Oh no! It's I was okay. just telling Blue about the the silly werewolf movie I watched. Oh yes, earlier. with the finger, the rude wolf. Um, yeah. Uh, um, and in it, like the the dude, one of the hints that the dude that Christina Ricci is dating is a werewolf is all the other ladies can't keep her their hands off him. Um. And then her younger, her nerdy younger brother suddenly, like, everyone wants to fuck him at school. The cheerleaders and then the homophobic bully who it turns out is a closeted gay guy. Um, it's really, like, ridiculous. There's a lady who, like, gets bitten in half <laughs> and then her upper, she keeps moving and is, like, still alive for, like, a good two minutes after she's cut in half. Um, Sounds great, it's real. to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> but I've, I've consumed so much garbage media over the pandemic. Can I be honest? It's, yeah. The only thing I care about now is BattleBots. Oh, <laughs> that was fun. That's the only thing I care about. Is I, I'm, I'm <gasps> ruined. I'm ruined. So, so we spend an um, for evening... For those who don't know, at oh, yeah. Emerald City, um, Amanda Blue and I shared a hotel room and our friends Iris and Nero gave us a beautiful gift of battle bots to watch in the hotel room. Um, I stand um, Ripperoni. Yeah, Ripperoni is is next level. I was talking to someone the next um, about how we watched Meredith McLaren and I watched The Mummy the night after, and I, I was like, uh. "What do you think had more explosions, battle bots or the mummy?" <laughs> They were different Rick. explosions. Amanda was in the yeah, group I, uh, the next night, and you weren't there, Kel. But we, uh, I think, when you were watching the Mummy, we were all debating what our battle bot sonas would be. Oh yeah, that was the, we were coming up with like names and like our w weapon choice. Everyone needs a battle bot sona, and what that means is you have to design your robot, and you just have to design your team behind the robot. Yeah, because that's the that's the thing, and so I I was a I'm a battle bots novice. I wasn't really aware of the format. Uh, the thing that made it so appealing is not just the robot and its design, but there is an entire team and a pilot who is like you know running the show, 
behind the, the plexiglass. And Ripperoni, who is uh, <laughs> is a robot who is pizza-themed and is shaped like a pizza box with a saw blade shaped like a pizza, their like, crew, their pit crew, is either dressed like pizza Italian place staff. Chefs. And then, yes, and then the, the main guy, the pilot, is like a cartoonish, like, Italian chef with a with a with a chef's hat and a fake mustache, uh, just like very intently running the controls. And then there's the gentleman the background, with the pizza Looming pocket. behind him in the background is a guy with like a, a see-through plastic pocket with a slice of pizza in it. And when Ripperoni won its bout, when everyone was cheering, this guy took out the pizza slice and shoveled it in his face faster than I've ever seen anyone do anything. It was so good. It was like peak television. I've never seen I anything haven't quite sh- like it. I have not actually shouted at a TV in years. Like, <laughs> I was straight up yelling at the TV. It's like, oh, is this what sports is like? Yeah, th- oh. that's really the best way to describe it is like the high of watching like sports. I get it now. I, I don't think I've ever like gotten excited and yelled. I'm poor Kel. We were so loud. Poor Kel. Normally, I, I don't was like very loud. Overstimulated. I I was like I. This is too much right now. <laughs> I did like that they all had hand gestures also, oh, yes. um, and that the uh, Ripperonis was the little Italian chef like finger and thumb <laughs> pinched together. I like I liked uh, Evan da- Dom was sitting next to me watching BattleBots, and I like. Uh, he has very subdued reactions, but very excited reactions. It was very fun. <laughs> very subdued, but no less intense, if that makes Does yeah. that make sense? No, that makes perfect sense, knowing Evan. I've, I, I've, told, I've told this story to you before, I'm sure, but um, in a previous convention, Evan and I were hanging out, and I, I, we were making plans, I think, to go to dinner or something, and I said something that I forgot does not have any meaning besides me and my wife, which is uh, when we agree to make plans, we say sounds goo because when we <laughs> text sounds good, one time one of us forgot the D and that became like a joke. So I said sounds goo <laughs> to Evan <laughs> without thinking. And he just very like quietly internalized it and repeated. And then like the broadest wiggliest smile like wiggled across his face. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like very, very him. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, that was Excellent. really good. <sighs> but yeah, Emerald City Comic Con was fun. Tiring. I'm v- I'm still tired. I'm yeah, still very I, tired. I, I literally had like a work thing to do every si- single day since I got back. And uh, <coughs> I don't know how long I can keep it up. I basically walked into <laughs> my apartment. Sunday. <laughs> I basically walked into my apartment, dropped everything at the front door. I have not touched it since. I refuse. I was exhausted. I, um... A four-day convention it is the worst idea. It's the worst. I love that no, show, also, but it's the worst idea. Also, also closing at 7 p.m. Uh, awful. Awful. Uh, awful. Awful, 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 awful. Um, so tired. I'm against it. Oh, it's so tired. Like I love it. I look. I was so excited. I looked forward to it. I was, but then I would look to my closet. I'm like, I don't have four good outfits. I have three good outfits. Oh no. I, I packed a bunch of like whimsical socks in yeah. every sweatshirt that I owned because I know from experience, like you basically have to wear two outfits. You have to wear like a shirt <laughs> and then you have to wear a sweatshirt over it and uh i decided i would only bring like one pair of shoes uh my like uh what are they called chelsea boots like the ones oh, yeah, that yeah, can yeah, handle yeah. rain the little zip zips um, and yeah and my my feet didn't love that decision no. but they're like broken enough that they were comfortable i brought two cute pairs of shoes my um my timberland boots and my cute little flats they each matched a different outfit but for the entire, I gave up and just wore the Crocs that are meant to be worn on the plane. I gave up. Like, no, this doesn't match any of my cute dresses, but I'm going Crocs. I can't do this. I'm dying slowly. I am dying, Squirtle. <laughs> uh, I got I, uh, home, like, at, like, 1 a.m. Uh, when I got back, too. And oh, that's it, right. Like, you left snowed. early. That's right. I, yeah, I left early. I got back, like... 1 a.m. Monday morning, and it just snowed. I live in Minnesota, and it was 
Like, I put on clothes <clears throat> to wear uh, on the way back so I wouldn't have to bring my big winter jacket. And it just, it sucked. I did finish Gideon <laughs> the Ninth Way for the taxi in the taxi line, so at least that's something. Oh, my um, Lyft driver on the um, way home just... He realized where I lived and was just giving me long lectures about being safe in my neighborhood. It was very condescending. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, blue. Yeah. Thoughts on Gideon the Ninth? Yeah, I've got them. <laughs> I don't Do you want to share like... them? Or will yeah, no, I get you. Good. I it's a time for me to tune out and go attend to the Iron Circus Twitter. I, yeah, I mean, I could talk about it a bit. I, I, I won't spoil it if that's what you're worried about, Amanda. If you don't give oh. a shit, that's Oh, I don't care about... No, no, no. I, I, don't, I don't care about spoilers at all. Y'all can talk if you want. I just... Amanda I won't just, know what you're talking general, about. doesn't give a shit. Um, yeah. That's well, I don't, totally fine. No, I, I mean, I don't, I don't give a shit about spoilers. I don't know if this is something I'd like to part consume eventually. It's more just... I will smile and not know what you're saying. So I'm going to take well, the opportunity. I'll, I'll, I'll premise it. I'll premise it. Because what I should start by saying is that me as a person, I have a terrible habit of never watching or reading or consuming anything when it is culturally relevant. I get this kind of like paralysis where I just like, even something I have a feeling I will like, I won't watch it or consume it or play it for like a solid year. I've been joking to friends that I'm almost positive I'll adore Disco Elysium, but knowing me, I will get to it in like 2026. Yes. So Gideon the Ninth is one of those things where I heard people talk about it, but I didn't go to read it. And so my only ways of absorbing any information about it at all was through Tumblr, which is always an interesting way to get information about anything yep. because it your primary like readership audience is both, both of like a bunch of socially undercooked teenagers. So I would get a whole bunch of like fan art of like knees up profile turnarounds of what appear to be teenage wizards mm -hmm. and a bunch of like long passionate like threads explaining what seemed to be extremely unethical acts. And that was like all I knew about what getting the like I kept telling people I could not tell you with a gun to my head what the setting of this was, what the plot of this book was. I was just absorbing names and images. And so it wasn't until a friend of mine, Soleil, uh, Soleil Ho, who like worked on a book with me said, oh, if you want to like compare it to anything, compare it to Umineko, which that I was familiar with because Soleil for like a while was like the peak Umineko expert in the Western hemisphere what or something. <laughs> Oh, my pleasure. Uh, so Umineko is a visual novel series from Japan that's basically a bunch of rich assholes in a, like, murder castle uh, at the mercy of, like, a witch. And so it's very, like, there's, like, lots of, like, over-the-top characters and purple prose and, like, that kind of thing. So that gave me a great premise of what to expect going in. So I sat down, I read it, a friend had lent me their copy, and... I, again, I don't think I dislike it. It took me quite a while to get into the uh, the writing style. It's lots of similes and metaphors. Lots of, I, like, very over-the-top, like, dialogue. I did not finish it. Um, okay. I think I got two-thirds of the way through and then thought, I don't care. Yeah. And moved on to something else. The thing that stood out to me that, again, I was kind of, like, frustrated at what my what my initial exposure to this was is that I think the descriptions of this murder castle in which the story takes place is generally very interesting. Like, it kind of gave me the impression that oh, this I, was intended to be a visual novel, but they wrote a book instead in a way that I, it's written very nicely. I would have loved to see what these visual novel backgrounds would have been like. I, I was very much, well, because the whole thing is like them solving murder puzzles. Yeah. And the way the murder puzzles were written was in a way that completely disinterested me. Um, yeah, the way, I think the best way to describe oh. it is like, it is told from the perspective of a person who doesn't understand all of the rules of the universe. It's kind of like if something was written from the, the, the dumb side character who is the fan favorite of a visual novel that doesn't exist. 
in a way where it's like there are things that are described about how the puzzles work that or the lore of the world that completely go over this character's head so you kind of just have to like pick up the pieces of what you do grasp and like run with it and i could see that being extremely frustrating and to it's it, people. also um i kept thinking if this was a video game i'd probably really like it because yeah. i would be an active participant in solving the puzzles um and um i felt like the puzzles also didn't like really tie into any like character arc so i feel like i just got they solved a puzzle and then they solved another puzzle and then they solved another puzzle um and then also um the main character had a vow of silence mm -hmm. so while we had her inner monologue she couldn't like actually engage with the other characters in a way that I was connecting with. Yeah, there were lots of characters who, and bear in mind, this is like the first book of a trilogy, the other books of which I've not read. And all of these Tumblr teens are very obviously like reacting to things that some of these characters do later. Um, Cause there are characters in this first book that I still feel like I don't know anything about the only thing but i know it, about this and this yeah. might be due to my twitter only exposure because i just don't look at t <sighs> tumblr has been on my shit list since they locked me out of my accounts and deleted all my accounts so i've been have been too bitter to go back so all my consumption has been through twitter all i know is fan art there might be gay characters and they wear like skull makeup that's all i know yeah I mean, you're not they incorrect. Are gay, they, and they, they have wear that. skull makeup. So yeah, those are accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's again. I don't know if I dislike it exactly. I just don't know if I've read anything quite like it, where it feels like you've, you're reading the single path of a visual novel, where if you had access to the other path, other things would have more meaning. But instead, mm -hmm. you're kind of like privy to conversations that in a way or kind of more realistically to how it would be if you were navigating a murder castle where you don't have context for every single Spike, thing. Spike, god damn it. What's going on with Spike? She left me up to... She's retweeting stuff onto the same timeline. Now we're both spamming. God damn it. <laughs> in any case, I, I feel like this is an example of something where I now want to make Spite fan art that is like the opposite of all other fan art I've seen. I want to do like illustrations that are just settings. Like I want to <laughs> like just make completely empty, like visual novel backgrounds and maybe throw like the tiniest skull face person in the background of the last one <laughs> and see how long people cotton on. Cause again, like they're really pretty described things like lots of like vaporwave elevator hallways and like crumbling atriums and like empty cinder block facilities and like it sounds fun someone is asking like a zero escape series but bad again i wouldn't necessarily describe it as bad just like incomplete in a way that could be interesting to some and extremely frustrating to others and i do genuinely like zero escape as a spectator who is like too chicken shit to sit down and spend 60 hours on a zero escape game but i have definitely gotten a lot of work done to let's plays that are 60 hours long of virtues last reward i've definitely done that um i i feel like you know this already uh but if you were if anyone knows me in my interests and wants to guess my favorite virtues last reward character uh you are almost certainly right <laughs> um yeah, it was, it's interesting, like, because Blue, um, I am someone who, when a thing gets really popular, I try to check it out to see, like, what's all this then? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I just bounced off super hard on um, uh, Gideon and the Ninth. Partly because it's, it's two things. One is... No one actually told me what it was about. Everyone just told me it's gay. And I'm like, well, I need to know what the gay people are doing. Yeah. If I'm going to read it. Yeah, I'm not um, getting burned by that again. And then um, 
so someone I know um, whose books I really like hates Gideon of the Ninth. <laughs> mm-hmm. And hates the press around it being like, finally, there are fantasy sci-fi lesbians. Um, <laughs> because they were like, there have been plenty of fantasy sci-fi lesbians. You just weren't paying attention. Um, and so they were, they sort of resented the fact that everyone was treating this as like the first and only sci-fi lesbians. Mm. Um, at the time that only the it's first sci-fi. Yeah, 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 I didn't know so that. So here's, so here's the thing, Amanda. Um, so here's the thing, Amanda. It, it is basically about a bunch of teen wizards and their knight companions who are investigating in N- Murder Castle to become like immortal necromancers. But this is like a space empire, and they travel to the Murder Castle through space. Mm. It is like a very biz- like again like the, the, when I finally <laughs> when I first looked up the Wikipedia article because I got sick of like only absorbing this through Tumblr, my eyes like crossed over because there (laughs) kept being so many like words and concepts that seemed like they shouldn't fit together, except for like some Warhammer bullshit. Um, Someone in the chat is saying that this uh, is like the top of a list of books that feels like fanfic without actually being fanfic. And that's like an excellent description of the writing style in a way that could be either extremely appealing or extremely irritating. There's like lots of like similes and metaphors that are sometimes extremely funny and and refreshing, and other times like, Oops. oh, you've got an AO3 body count, don't and you, Tamsin Muir? Think, I think that that is also a good example of it because I feel like it doesn't really do the work to properly establish the characters. Yes, I um, agree. Because. When you read a fanfic, even if it's a really good fanfic, they don't have to explain who the characters are because since it's a fanfic, you already know who these characters are. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, why are you reading this fanfic? Um, and so, um, yeah, it, it just feels like, I don't know, there's a hole there that they didn't properly fill in. And then yeah. the fact that the character can't talk to the other characters um, and, like, connect with them and get to know them um, exacerbates that problem. The other thing I'm, I'm going to be interested about in seeing how this book series ages is that I like the prose. It kind of feels like it was written in the early 2020s. And it makes me, it reminds me of, um, so I, I, I quite enjoy Becky Chambers' uh, Psalm for the Wild Built. I think that's an excellently written book. So I went back and I started reading the um, Long Way to a Small Angry Planet uh, series. And it's, it's also good, but Small Angry Planet especially, like I feel like you can very precisely carbon date that book. I say this ha- liking Becky Chambers' prose, Smaller Angry Planet was written during a time when people used the word awesome sauce. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's that kind of, like... It, there's just a little bit of that to the prose that dates it, and I'm kind of curious if Gideon the Ninth is also going to experience that in, like, five, ten years' time. <laughs> Nero! I'm sorry, we have an extremely important update from Nero. <laughs> Oh, yes, it, ch- it is. I, I did know that, Nero. I did learn that recently. Um, I, oh, uh, boy. That, oh, now that that's said, this is kind of like, Kel, I think you told me that it's there's a rumor that Small Angry Planet started as, like, Firefly. No, it's not fanfic. a rumor. She flat out said so in an interview. Um, okay, okay, okay. It's Firefly fan fiction. Um, <laughs> uh... God, the, everything makes so much more sense now. Yeah, um, that that's why they say awesome sauce. It's the firefly. Um, uh, oh, so I'm just doing that, some corny shit. That's partly why I didn't check out. That's partly why I didn't check out. Um, Becky Chambers is a long way to a small angry planet because I was, I hate fireflies so much. Um, yeah. 
like uh i just i have a i have a hatred for it that you can only have if you used to like it yeah no i can relate i feel like her books um, improve with every one and i think that there are things that are like that are either sidestepped or like reconsidered in that book that knowing if, if this was like a firefly like reskin i feel like she she takes some steps with it that needed to be taken but um, god i'm trying to think what are some other like i it's been a really wild book like year for me in terms of reading books because i feel like gideon the ninth uh is like on the opposite side of the scale of roadside picnic which is the other like big sci-fi book i've read this year so far uh they feel like it <laughs> feels like like uh like filet mignon and like snickerdoodles they feel like completely different food how dare you disparage um, snickerdoodles but uh blue, i'm sorry those I, those cookies I, suck I, shit amanda i'm <gasps> sorry blue, those I are my favorite that, cookie i'm um, going to fight you <laughs> right here right blue, now I, I knew that um gideon the ninth was um uh homestuck fanfic because of our conversation before last Emerald City, um, because we've talked about how um, Long Way to a Small Angry Planet is Firefly fanfic and Getting in the Ninth is Homestuck fanfic before. Um, because And that's what led to the conversation of what's the thing that, like, people can read and immediately zoom in and be like, oh, this is the foundation of your work. Um mm. Which led to me explaining and then showing you the Tenth Kingdom. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And I knew that had to come from somewhere. Um, oh, what a fun, what a fun time that was. Uh, yeah, I've been trying to keep better track of the books that I'm reading this year in my day journal. Um, I've been doing that um, in nerd. my newsletter. I'm writing down every book and um tv show and movie that i've watched um to maybe that's something that i should I do with my it. stupid puppet vlogs i've been trying to think of like what are the Ooh. things i used to tweet because that's my whole thing with my puppet vlogs it's basically all the things i used to tweet a lot are now just going to be puppet vlogs that's a yeah. good idea and i'm like oh maybe i could just bitch about shit like that <laughs> Uh, so like I, I like write down. <gasps> I could make one about my battle, my my battle bot Sona. You totally yeah. could. I Do I've it. thought about it. It would be we, we, someone joke. Oh, like the Rat King. It'd be a bunch of little mini bots. No, 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 no. I have thought about it. You it too. would be circular, and it would have um, basically flails, little ball um, with ball bearings in the bottom, so they glide. <laughs> Yeah, and that would be the rat tail thing. But they oh, wouldn't be I attached see. by a chain. It'd be a bolt, a metal rod, a bolt. Well, not a rod. I don't know how to describe things. I will draw it. Don't you worry. I thought about this because I used to watch the old battle bots. Um, with my stank ass dad. Would you call it the Rat King? What Probably. would your battle bot Sona name be? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I was I was talking about this with with Iris, who was just like bestowing. She she was doing the thing where she would like look at you and like identify your weapon. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, yes. I remember this conversation happening while I was very upset about walking. God, I'm trying to remember exactly the 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 layout of the conversation because we were talking about different kinds. It was pretty of rapid box. fire. Yeah, there was like, uh, you know, some battle bots have like piercing weapons or, or saw blades and some of them use hammers. And then Iris stops and she goes like, and then there's the rare gun type. <laughs> yeah, 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 the gun. Which she bestowed on Mel Kilman. <laughs> gun type. <laughs> you get the, I remember it's pretty rapid fire. It's like, you would get this and you would get this and you would get this. Yeah. If I'm remembering correctly, I think we thought a good premise for mine would be well they named me I, I i my name was ultramarine and i thought it would be fun if it was like all that like non-photo replicable blue oh like yeah everything was painted blue so like it didn't show up on tv properly 
like a fucking William Gibson invention, like it would be fun. I think. Wait, to I look thought non photo blue just didn't Xerox. Is there it different? Just, yeah, blue? it just doesn't Xerox. It still shows up for. On TV. There was. I thought there was a certain color of blue that, like, if you tried to take a picture of it or photograph it, like, it, I'm unfamiliar it just, with this. It looked different. From, no, it's just photo. Uh, not photo blue. Just doesn't Xerox. Okay. Um. There's like some, I, I remember this happening with flowers once. Like I took a picture of a flower that was like this kind of electric, electric, like bluish purple. There, there's and I looked at the photo later and I was like, that is not the color I, I saw. I do know the thing with um, blue in nature is oh. that it doesn't, if I remember right, when blue occurs in nature, it's usually because of structures, not because of like pigments. <laughs> so that results in you not being able to capture the colors right in like anything with uh, like with a screen or printing it because um, it's never going to look as quite like real life because a lot of the color is coming from structural shapes. Mm -hmm. Oh, Chris, is which is why it took blue Klein international blue Klein. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm no, it's fine. I'm, I'm not talking about anything important. <laughs> yeah. This is the blue I was thinking of international Klein, Klein blue. It's like, it's like, eye blisteringly blue in a way that I think would be extremely cool and like slightly threatening to see something that was like entirely this color, like even the screws. I think that would be extremely rad actually. Yeah. There's no blue birds. It's refraction. I think that's there is a William Gibson book that has this in it. I knew it. I knew <laughs> it. There's a, yeah. Um, in, in the William Gibson novel, zero history, Fictional advertising mogul Hubertus Bijan wears a suit of IKB because it unsettles people. Okay, I must have remembered this detail because I definitely remember this from a William Gibson book. <laughs> uh, but yeah, colors are interesting. Love, love them. Like, um, love colors. I think I was remembering that, like, if you want to make food look good, you will put hues of, like, reds and oranges and stuff because that's a... That is a... Color that f food that is safe for humans typically occurs in. But if you want food to look bad, you'll put a blue hue over it. Because in general, we are not conditioned to see blue as something we should eat. Yeah. Mm. Color makes us hungry. Yeah. I mean, uh, things in shades of blue. Because think about it, There's really no blue foods naturally occurring yeah, like that we can eat. Blueberries are actually purple. Yeah. Not really blue. Hmm. <laughs> Mel and I were talking about blue raspberries. Well, we were talking about raspberries and like berries because this is Mel Gilman. Um, and we were talking about there's apparently a variation of raspberries called the blue raspberry that is not like blue, blue, but it's like that kind of bluish black. Mm. Uh, but those are pretty good. Apparently you could find them in the Pacific Northwest. I'm quite fond of the white raspberries myself. It, Those are it, yummy. Isn't the fact that humans like sparkly shinies because shiny sparklies mean we can see water in the distance? Mm. I heard that I once. That I don't sense. I don't know if it's true. Yeah. I don't know if it's true, but that makes sense. That's why sparkly um, shinies catch our eye. It's like, ooh, I want that. Hmm. Also, I mean, sparkly shinies. Sparkly shinies. Sparkly shinies. I'm just thinking about sparkly shinies. I'm just looking at, I'm reading all about. I'm also thinking, I'm also thinking that just makes me think about the time I got high off that edible snickerdoodle, which was a great flavored cookie, but I shouldn't <laughs> eat edibles. And I got very upset on the car. I was not driving. I should, there, I should clarify. I was in the back seat driving home from Seattle to Portland when I lived over there. And I got very upset because we passed a sign. I've told this story a million times, I think. But mm -hmm. it's just one of those visceral, this is why I don't eat edibles stories. Um, but we passed a sign for a jewelry store, and I got really upset because I was just like, jewelry is just rocks we get out of the ground, and we charge so much money for it. And I got really upset. <laughs> and then uh, Joseph and Lynn were like, are you having a good time back there? And I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> Oh, God. Now I'm thinking about... So when we were in, um, uh, at the hotel, we ordered all that food. I still can't get over how bad that... Oh, you weren't there for my bad ramen blue? Uh, yeah. No. This, if oh. this was Sunday, I wasn't there. It was the worst yeah. ramen I've ever had in my life. 
Oh no. My noodles were yeah, solid. Um, basically blue. Um because the restaurant we ordered from the first night refused to give us utensils. I was trying to find a different restaurant um that had both sushi and ramen. Um mm -hmm. and the place that was closest was awful. Like awful. everything that they gave us was bad. Like there they did give us utensils, <laughs> but yeah, it was um you mean you didn't have to eat sushi with coffee stirs from the Starbucks downstairs? Yeah. I would have preferred that. But yeah, no, my, like, my, the broth tasted like nothing. My noodles were a giant solid mess. I actually got, like, my shirt sopping wet from determinedly trying to eat it because I was that hungry. The only reason I didn't actually try to con actually consume it is because Corey got too full of her pasta and was like, do you want my pasta? And I was like, please, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your kindness. I won't eat my giant congealed noodle mass. Oh, that sounds awful. <laughs> but, but that was kind of cool. It's kind of cool when you have the worst thing you've ever had. Yeah. It's like, ah, there is a bottom. I mean, <laughs> worst thing you ever had without it making you physically ill. I mean, I've had good things make me physically ill. So, like, I don't think. Yeah, but th that's its own category. Yeah. Though. Like, for example, yeah. like, I've had delicious lobster dinners that made me violently sick. So, like, <laughs> I don't know. Making a food making me sick has nothing to do with its quality. Yeah. Was by comparison, my last meal in Seattle was excellent. I, I wanted to, I realized I was very getting very close to leaving Seattle without really having a seafood. So after I packed up everything on the show floor, I like ran down to Pike Place and I got like a little cup of seafood soup called Chopino, which is like uh, the catch of the day in like some tomato based like broth. Um, and I will admit that I got this because our friend from Seattle High wrote a very long Star Trek fan fiction that featured the characters eating Chopino. So when I got the cup of soup, I did go just like in High's fan fiction. But it was excellent. Oh, shit. Like, I did it wrong. Five bucks for like one of the best cups of soup I've ever had. Don't look at me. The food of my, yeah, the food of my people. <laughs> Very much, very much, a very, very patriotic Italian American uh, this this past week. Sorry, I'm doing tweets. No, that's fine. I'm gonna look up more weird colors. Should we look up shades of blue on Wikipedia, everyone? There's some good ones. Um, <laughs> yeah. I have a really good book by Christopher Moore which is about um, ultramarine mm -hmm. and how the reason why it was the sacred blue is because it was the only blue paint that didn't like fade into a weird color. Um, so churches were very exclusively like, this is what you have to paint the Virgin Mary with. Mm -hmm. um, so her cloak will always be blue, even as like the paint gets old. Um, so this book is about like this creature that like bed, right? feeds off artists is using this blue to like basically if the artist is using it and she's inspiring them, that's what lets her like suck their life force out. Ooh. Um, and it takes place during um uh the French Impressionist movement, um, because that's when synthetic paint started to get made. Mm -hmm. um, so basically her food source is getting threatened because now painters are using the cheaper synthetic blue rather than like this very specific expensive blue. Hmm. That, what, what's this book called? Do you remember? S Sakura Blue. <laughs> Okay. Um, I uh, And it's a Christopher Moore book, and if you haven't read a Christopher Moore book, he really likes dick jokes. Mm -hmm. um, he likes to mix crude humor in with his very well-researched historical fantasies. Okay. Um, he 
He has a whole book, uh, Fluke, which is about researching whales. Um, and it turns out there's like a whale civilization under the sea that kidnapped Amelia Earhart. Basically, anyone who went quote unquote missing in the Bermuda Triangle has been kidnapped by these whales. Um, hmm. And it's very fixated on the fact that they have prehensile dicks. It's very clear, like, in his research, he learned that and was like, well, I'm going to reference this as much as possible in my book. Yeah. Um, he, has a, he has a plan. Yeah. Uh, this makes me want to reread. Um, you were you talking about, like, the history of Blue reminded me. This is a nonfiction book, but um, I really enjoy this book called Color, A Natural History of the Palette. Um, I'm looking up the author right now. It's basically a nonfiction book that goes into different colors and pigments and like their history and how they're made and stuff. And the the way that the book is ordered is very interesting because it kind of goes from like oldest known pigments slash colors to newest. So they do touch on like blue eventually and they touch on green. Like, you know, there's lots of stories that people have heard before about how like Napoleon's like uh, exile island was wallpapered in like a green wallpaper that was infused with arsenic and it probably killed him or whatever. The first uh, the first chapter is super interesting though because the color that they go into first is ochre, which is like for lots of like indigenous civilizations like the first pigment that you obtain. And there's a really really interesting kind of sidebar about the author traveling to like. Australia and like researching and talking to people who are like traditional artists and use ochre and stuff because the way that like knowledge is shared and transmitted is super interesting like they're super protective of it so if you want to like learn about particular ways that like ochre is harvested or how it's like made into pigment and used you have to like go to a physical library in a particular town and you have to go into a particular room with like a phone, like a two-way phone, like you'd see in like a like a prison, uh, like interviewing room, where you pick up the phone and the person will convey the information you need on the other end. But that's the only way you have access to that information. Like it was fascinating. Um, yeah, it was a it was a good yeah. Like Victoria Finlay is uh, the author's name. Um, this other book, Bright Earth by Philip Ball. I don't know that one. I'm gonna look it up. I've been meaning to read the color book, though, because I do remember the color, the chapter on blue is super duper interesting for the reasons that you outlined. And also, like, the history of synthetic color palettes. There's a whole, there's a whole one about mauve. Like, mauve is a very famous, like, historical uh, artificial color. <laughs> like, it, it knocked people's socks off when the dude in, who invented mauve invented mauve. looking up this book right now the philip ball one or yeah the philip ball yeah. one yeah i could read about color for a long time it's really interesting uh sorry i'm quiet it's okay. we're just talking about mauve i know amanda do you like mauve you seem like you would like the color mauve it's okay yeah what's your favorite color green I wouldn't have pegged you for liking green best. Yeah, it's my favorite color. Um, I, what kind I, of green? I think, like, forest greens. Anything but neon. I don't like neon any colors. No neons ever. Never mm -hmm. neons. Um, I like autumn. Well, it's also, like, what do you mean by favorite? Like, I don't know. I like lots of colors for different reasons. Like, when it comes to, like, what do I want to live in? Like, if you get a color to paint your home, I want green walls and then everything in my home autumn colors. Hmm. When it comes to clothes, I want to look like a clown. A pastel clown. Right. Yeah, I kind of assumed that you would like pink best or purple or something. I like pink, but I get tired of it quickly. Also, I, I only like... orange. I hate orange. Well, I don't like orange that much. Oh, okay. I like it only when it's burnt orange and only when it's in conjunction with other colors. I don't okay. like orange very much. Hmm. Orange, it, it, it leans towards, like, too bright and too fiery. I don't like it. It's too bright. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I, I, pink is a good default, but I don't know. It just depends on the situation. Oh, what about you? Uh, blue. The blue that I use on my website, basically. <laughs> oh, let me look that up. Kind of like a subdued sort of... Yeah. You're just killmcdonald.com, right? Yeah. It's my brand. Okay. Interesting. My my yeah, favorite color is like... also blue, but I go for kind of like a cobalty, yeah, like ultramarine kind of blue. Like closer to cyan y or more more I, I tend to like darker blues than lighter blues, but I do like a good okay. turquoise. Okay. Like more like rich blues. Yeah, whereas I like desaturated blues. Yeah. I like desaturated colors in general. I hate oversaturated colors like uh I don't like neons, but I do like I found I really like the um like if you've ever seen like a PA Mondrian painting, like the kind of very strong primary colors, I love like a strong like firm yellow and I like kind of a vermilion-y red and I love like a deep blue. I used to think I hated yellow, but then I saw people start wearing good shades of yellow. Like when goldenrod yellow started becoming like a popular color to wear, my my world completely changed. I love goldenrod uh, I yellow. I tend to like cooler colors rather than warm colors. Yeah. Um, so so I'm also partial to a forest green. Um, I would just uh, pair it with blues. Yeah, there's probably worse ways to spend my Thursday night than looking at the Wikipedia article for a yellow. Oh, there's another good um, pigment for you. Uh, there's a yellow pigment called Gamboge that is from, like, it's mostly harvested in Cambodia, I think from a particular kind of tree or kind of sap. But it's like the tree most commonly grows in like the killing fields. So if you like go harvest gamboge for a living, like you could like pull out like a bullet when you're like harvesting and selling gamboge. But I do remember for which 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 story was it? Oh, it was for sex machines, Smut Peddler Sex Machine. I named all the robots after colors. Uh, because we were going for kind of like a bright, like primary color palette and i think the main robot is named after gamboge but i don't <laughs> remember it's been a while um i'm gonna change the topic because i don't have anything else to say about color i i, <laughs> I have a lot of opinions about color my attention is just extremely divided i feel bad my attention is extremely divided at the moment it's okay um blue what'd you get at uh emerald city well, um, I was trying to not buy too much stuff this year, um, but I did pick up a few things that I've been meaning to get for a while. Um, I got Evan's book, Harrowing of Hell. I got a bunch of uh, Jay Eaton's um, mini comics for their upcoming book, Runaway to the Stars, which I've gotten really into. And then I got like a whole bunch of stickers and prints and stuff. I got myself a little postcard by, I think it was Ron Chan of Kim Kitsuragi uh, to shame me into playing Disco Elysium sometime this calendar year. And I also ran into uh, uh, Fairy Wind, who is a collaborator with me on a comic that just came out, uh, <clears throat> but is also another Pacific Rim veteran. And uh, they were wandering around giving out little Our Flag Means Death postcards so i got one of those from them along with a very fun original drawing that i was not expecting at all uh i had asked for like a doodle and they came back with like this watercolor drawing <laughs> that oh, i will great. treasure because <laughs> it is a picture of newt from pacific rim in a sexy astronaut costume good 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 um i got um a dirty book from you um, you did. No. And you did. Then I got um, uh, Mel's um, Other Ever After book. Um, mm -hmm. 
then I got um, uh, Amy Chu recently wrote a Camilla book. Um, no. at, uh, like the vampire? So I grabbed that. Um, um, I don't know much about it other than it's based off Camilla's. Um, but I like Amy Chu's writing in general, so I um, grabbed that. Um, <clears throat> and then I got the new Adventure Zone book because I'm a nerd. Oh, I mean, those are good. Like, Carrie keeps knocking it out of the park with those. They're on um, the town that's trapped in a time loop. Yeah, that's a good one. That's, I think, got my favorite character. That's the one with um, Roswell, right? The knight with the bird? Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah. Roswell. I felt bad because, like... No one. Well, like whenever I'm doing the Iron Circus comic booth, I'm doing my I'm not selling my own stuff, so I don't have anything to sell. But I also don't get to leave it very often. So like I got like twenty minute breaks to like sweep over the tables and be like, ah, oh, that looks cool. Okay, that looks cool too. Okay, bye. Man, I kept coming over to see if you needed anything. Yeah, but I felt bad not making sales. It, it it's yeah. I could have taken breaks, but there's because it's I'm not just making sales and not making sales for myself. I'm making sales for someone else. And you feel like an ob you know, you have an obligation, it feels like. And I did lose an hour of my fucking day because the GES booth is at the bottom floor and hidden behind green curtains. And it took me an hour to sort that out. And I just I was in a panic, basically. I don't like wasting other people's time, if that makes sense. So I would desperately wanted to get back to the booth there. Every time I left the table, I was like. I'm missing sales. I have to get back. I have to get back. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'm sure I could have def. I, it's not like I didn't have people who could take over for me and help, but like it, it, it gave me anxiety. Mm -hmm. I have a problem. Yeah. No, it was, it was, there was a lot of like stuff that I definitely would have been in, interested in, in picking up, but I had to I had to stick to budgets. I know, not getting that much. I did I did get a little hanging banner from the short box booth because it did Oh I wanted one of those. Cute. It's it's cute. I gotta figure out where I'm gonna hang it. Maybe on the back of my door. I mean since it's a fabric banner, I can like have a little more flexibility hanging it somewhere. Um and then as soon as Emerald City was over, the discourse started on Twitter. Because uh -huh. comics Twitter always needs something to be mad about. I don't know mm -hmm. what the discourse is. Oh, someone told, uh, do you know the Monkey Minion booth? Nope. Yeah, I know of it. They they have like sci-fi themed prints. Um, ah. Um, and they're at a lot of shows. And apparently someone told them that they shouldn't be at comic shows because they don't make comics. Hmm. Well then, and... well then, why the hell are half the guests there? Yeah, basically, like, <laughs> the... yeah. That's... Why was Mark Ruffalo there? <laughs> yeah, not from he a comic. Make comics either. Actually, I don't know. Maybe Mark Ruffalo does make comics. I don't um, know. Wasn't there to but, sell them? Yeah, like, fuck yeah, off. It's just so fucking ridiculous. Fuck um, off. Um. Yeah. Yeah, why were um, the fucking WWE guest stars at the Wizard World we went to? A comic show. God, like, that's so City stupid. Did, yeah. City and, did. and then it led to, like, some people... Uh, it might have also been partly because um, Rose City told people if they got into Artist Alley. Um, and Rose City has had a rule that you are not allowed to sell crafts in the artist alley you have to sell paper products is how they phrase it hmm. um so they want you to sell books or they want you to sell prints they don't want um you to sell dolls shirts and or shirts. bandanas yeah. or pins merchandise or, yeah um i mean that i can see that um and yeah, so like, so yeah, so it's like that the monkey minions people getting told they shouldn't be in a comic show that like spilt over into people talking about that. Um, and then like, 
Uh, I did bring up uh, Christian Cheney in chat saying SBX to TCAF is more of an argument about not comic sellers shouldn't be there. And I do think those shows should give priority to comics. I get annoyed when well, people who don't like comics get tables there, but they usually don't. I um, wouldn't mind if Emerald City Comic Con gave preference to comicers. I wouldn't mind that. But the thing is, it's really dumb to crack down on like someone selling sci-fi prints when you have vendors downstairs selling like anime figurines and you have yeah, guests who are yeah. from movies. Like, like no. Like that's 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 a terrible place to pick your battles. Like yeah. so I used the example when I was talking to Meredith of SBX and TCAF. Yeah, don't give I it, people should sell comics at those because those are specifically small press shows. shows and they don't have an exhibitor booth. Uh, that and they are small press shows and press means something. Yeah. Um, and it's also it reminded me of Anime Boston in its frequently asked questions used to have, why don't you have more American comic artists who are influenced by anime at your show? Um, and... Uh, their response was, because we're an anime show, idiot. Like, they've changed it to basically give the same answer, but to be less of a dick about it in their answer. But it's like, yeah, like, I understand they're, like, reading that, I was like, that's fair. Like, if they want to focus very specifically on anime um, and Japanese-specific imports, that's their prerogative of the people that run the show. Um, and, um, so, you know, they can spend their money on, like, getting pillows to perform a concert or whatever, um, which they believe they did one year. So, yeah, so it's one of those. And then Kelly Turnbull gave the example of this horror convention that used to be small industry folks only, um, and people selling really elaborate but expensive like sculptures um and like uh effects setups um so it was like things that cost thousands of dollars um yeah nero got monster palooza hmm. um and then as soon as they started to advertise it as like more of a fan show like they got less and less people selling those big elaborate things but also less people wanting to buy those elaborate things and before the pandemic it was basically all ten dollar prints or keychains and fan art for horror stuff so um if you were someone that was looking for those really expensive like set pieces you don't have a place to go anymore um so I think it's kind of like whoever's running the con gets to make those decisions um, is my sort of opinion on it. Um, but like Monkey's Minion like at Emerald City like there, there are other people like who don't make comics to come down on first than yeah. some indie art print person. Like, yeah. Ugh, that's dumb. I'm glad I missed it. Again, yeah. I basically walked into my apartment, dropped, like, my suitcases and all the banners, and I mean, not the banners, the con display stuff, is still by my front door. I dropped everything, including my jacket and my purse, by the front door, tended to my rats, took a bath, and then played Wobble Dogs for two days straight. <laughs> How are I, how are your rats, Amanda? My rats are lovely. Um, they the younger ones missed me. BB and Pumpkin did not, and were seemed annoyed I came back. They don't like me very like, much. Oh, you're here. <laughs> yes. Well, it's because um BB. Whenever I see him, he gets cleaned by me because he's not good at cleaning himself. And um, Pumpkin has always been standoffish, especially now that I trim his teeth. So, uh, 
when they see me, they have like, oh God, she's back. And BB's like, panic, panic. She's going to wash me. I have to go quick and get out. Uh, the younger ones are very excited. Uh, they're turning into squishy little friends. Oh, I'm so excited to see them Yay! someday. I want to see your rats. I want to be groomed by them. Oh, oh goodness. It, it's so easy. You just stick your arm in, especially if you're new. And they're like, you have so many smells. Any arm hairs. And they will go, all right, time to clean this hair. <laughs> Meticulously. Oh, they're little rat. They're little precious things. <laughs> I love a rat. Yeah, I, ever since I got back uh, Monday morning, I've just had like one thing. I had to I had to go directly into teaching class the next day, which didn't feel great. No, but I got those done. I ran like a mock comic convention for one of my classes on Tuesday, <laughs> which generally went pretty well. I think that was they seemed to get a kick out of that. Um, one of my students drew my dog sandwich, uh, which is a, very exciting. I got a. Yeah, picture of that and, and show it to you guys later. <laughs> um, and then I basically have just been like catching up on things that I wanted to start doing once I got back. I tapped my maple tree for the third time uh, for third year in a row. Um, <laughs> now that it is, it's it's snowing, but it is consistently above freezing during the daytime, which is like peak tapping season. So I've got, I'm looking at my bucket outside my office window uh, and just gonna see if it how long it takes for that bucket to fill up. And now let me think, what else do I gotta do? Just you know, catching up on, um, on work. Real and quick, like that. no. There's less than an hour left in failure to launch his backer kit crowdfund. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't yet, please go back it. Um, give us your dollars. It's a really good, first of all, the book is huge. Like it's way bigger than I thought it was going to be until I saw the like table contents. Fucking make me. It's a big well, book. I feel like it is about the same size as like Sleep of Reason. It's just a lot of people did short stories. Oh, um, I see. So um, it is like 320 pages ish. It's just, there's all a right. lot of like five page, six page stories in it. Got it. That I mean, Sleep sense. of Reason is still a fat baby. That's still yeah, a fat Yeah, but it's not, book. like, that much fatter than other um, Iron Circus anthologies. Yeah. Yeah, but, um, I mean, I'm, I don't, I'm not comparing it to Iron Circus. I'm comparing it to comics I've seen from other people. We make fat babies. Fatty, fat, fat. Yeah, we make, yeah. like, I, I, as again, I, I got refreshed being at Emerald City Comic Con and getting to look at whatever, like, the, the size of books and go... Yeah, our books can kill people. <laughs> we make fat <laughs> fucking books. Especially if it's like full color, like that thing is way oh, denser. Oh god, yeah. Cuz the page is. Yeah, I like is. I like a lot of the stories in there. Iris who who gave me my BattleBot Sona did a comic about the Ibo that I found particularly Yeah, that's good. the one I just tweeted about. Oh, let me go I'm going to go I'll retweet it also. Uh, what were some other ones from the from the book that y'all really like? I haven't read it yet, personally. Mm -hmm. I I have I the mean, privilege I... of working in the warehouse, so when the books come in, I I I take them. <laughs> Nero has read it all. Nero, what's your favorite? Nero's in the chat. Uh... Well, people can't read that, so until then, there's also a a delay. Yeah. But yeah, um, no, uh, I do. I can. I can probably read the PDF, but I'm now that I have access to the warehouse. I just. I'm like. I wait to read them when they're books, and now I can just read them for free, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. Oh yeah, there's a comic about the hippo, the Mississippi hippos. Yep, yep. Oh, that's one of my favorite. Louisiana hippos, but yeah, um, that's yeah. a good one. There's um, a that was a that was another book I read. I want to say last year that was basically <laughs> expanding on the what if of the. Yeah, I, I do really like the the baby machine. Um, oh hmm. God, yeah. So the, the the baby net, like. Um, oh yes. Centrifugal force to pop out babies and splat them. Um, oh, no, not splat them. Uh, Gently catch them in a net. <laughs> Just shoot out of ladies. Um, uh, Apparently, Nero then, is biased because. They gave Iris the Ibo idea because they were an Ibo obsessed teen. I mean, to be fair, it's a cool story. I know, I do know the story. 
I haven't read it, but I do know what they were writing about because I have been flies on many walls. That's another thing. It's like it's it's weird to be flies on walls when things are getting made because like you haven't read it, but you'd heard the scripts. <laughs> um, the computer repair shop one's good too. Um, mm. uh, also, the one about shooting Elon in the dick. Um, well, not mm. like, it's not really about. Not, I was about Elon to say like dick. not. It, yeah. That's not what it's about. It's about uh, the Luddites and how um, capitalist propaganda has made us think ill of them, but really Man. they are the heroes of their age. I don't know. <clears throat> this just made me think about it, but I remember watching a news special about, because of course, anytime something has to do with rats, I hone in on it because I'm like a freak. But um, I remember that watching this woman who was hired to solve a problem in a building where they were trying to rewire this old building. They didn't want to take down the walls and it was, they didn't have the technology to like snake something through. So she said, why not rats? So they trained rats to basically have the, ta the, the cables they needed to wire through the walls, have the wires strapped to the rats, and then they would lead the rats like with taps and stuff to an exit point and would train them to follow their taps and exit. And they would basically feed the wires through the walls that way. And it just made me think, <laughs> can you like imagine if that's how electricians worked now? If they just had armies Here, of rats? I forget what type of pipe or industry this is. But basically, the pipes were really long. Yeah, they trained ferrets. Yeah, That's ferrets. Where I was going. They yeah. trained ferrets to clean optic, um, fiber optic cables because they're really long. <laughs> um, and they just, like, attached a cleaning thing to the ferret <laughs> and trained it to go through. Um... Ferret helped build the this, this CERN, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I just I want to just be like I I'd love to like a a, a short like a, a story or something just about electrician like I'm here with my vermin. Here's a historical <laughs> building. We cannot tear it down. It's okay. I have fifty rats. Uh, Felicia that's, that's the great... Felicia the ferret. It has a name. Felicia. Felicia the ferret. Yeah, those tubes do love being in tubes. They are stinky, but they are great. That would be a great, like, class in a cyberpunk <laughs> setting is, like, a like a vermin monger. Like, someone who can uh, send things into the walls and deal with wires and stuff. <laughs> uh, I love I that, like... I like, if you're doing a story where they uplift animals, like, that would be one of the most useful animals to uplift um ferret ferrets um i would okay i would disagree because ferrets are domesticated to the point that they are kind of lazy bastards they are not as smart as their weasel cousins hmm i would maybe pick a different weasel unless like i don't know they'd have to be very carefully trained <laughs> ferrets like uh, well, from, that's from, what I was saying. If they were uplifted, um, I don't know. Because that—that's when they give animals human. Right. I know. No. No. But I'm saying they're lazy. So even if they're uplifted, I they think just you should. I think if you're anything. going to uplift something, it should be city rats, not pet rats. City rats. City rats. Yeah. Pet rats also have the ferret problem where they're lazy. I mean, some are some are not, but like again, they're kind of inherently little fat losers, and I love them. I figure if you uplift a rat, it'll be like, oh, I can use the remote now. Hooray! Yeah, they do sleep longer than cats. That's another fun ferret fact that people like. Like that make ferrets very different from their uh, wild counterparts, as they are. Oh my god, they will just like sleep their entire lives away and then wake up for two hours and like tear your shit up. Oh, I love them. I love them so much. They're so good. True, we are also lazy. Oh yeah, the pouch rats who find landmines. Oh, those are good. The Gambian oh. pouch rats. They work oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. they work for bananas. <laughs> 
Because they're... There were rats that did that in, like, um, Europe, too, after, like, the World Wars. Because yeah. they're small enough that they can't set them off, but they can sniff them out. I'm looking at... Yeah. Oh, this is a cute little guy. It's got, like, a two-colored tail. Like, it's yeah. brown in the half closest to the butt, and then it's got, like, a light color near the near the end yeah gambian pouch rats are neat that's kind of the rat that people who like keep rats look at and go damn i wish my rat was that big the organization that helps train the pouch rats is called a popo mm -hmm. cute they get little awards there's a few uh pouched uh he they're called hero rats and they get medals uh, they are decorated hero rats Oh my god, there's a hero rat who died last year named Magawa, born 2013, died January 2022. A Gambian pouched rat that worked as a hero rat sniffing out landmines. He's got his own Wikipedia page. He was the most <laughs> successful landmine sniffing rat in the, history's or, in the organization's history. Yeah. He, uh, from 2016 to 2021, he cleared more than 22.5 hectares of land <laughs> in Cambodia. In that time, he found 71 landmines and 38 instances of other unexploded ordnance. Yep. God, that's so cool. He was described by the program manager as a, quote, very exceptional rat upon his retirement. <laughs> what a good creature. Yeah, Miranda, Kristen, that's, that's like a, a good... Twitter bio right there. A very <laughs> exceptional rat. I wish that was me, but I'm, it's not. I can't, I can't. I'm sorry. I can't be her. He retired from bomb sniffing, spent a number of weeks mentoring 20 newly recruited rats <laughs> before ultimately retiring and dying peacefully in January 2022. What a wonderful creature. But yeah. And, um, oh, they got a little harness. They yep. got a little harness. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kristen points out, like, one of the reasons they are so good and better than dogs is dogs will do false positives because they're kind of eager to please. Whereas a rat just want banana, does not give a shit about how you are reacting to it. So they are very task oriented. They will do whatever it takes to get that banana. And they don't get that banana if they don't get results. They don't look at you and go, am I doing good? They're like, no, need a banana. I'm, I'm, I'm dropping this picture of Magawa, the hero rat, with his <laughs> tiny little metal. He's wearing a tiny little metal. I think I've seen this little dork before. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in there. Yeah, that's the one, the decorated hero rat. Yeah. How good. Very I know cute. some people are starting like pouched breeding rat pro br <sighs> pouched rat breeding programs and uh they are definitely not domesticated so uh, it's going to be a while. It's also harder the longer an animal lives like the slower domestication uh occurs because you got to get through all those generations. Someone made a sculpture of Magawa the hero rat. Hold on. <laughs> it's cute, and he's also wearing his little medal. Love a hero. Ah, oh, look at this good creature. Oh, what a good sculpture. Here, I'll link. It's good. I right? will link this in the uh, YouTube chat. Oh, what a good creature. He's a good little guy. What a good creature. I'm gonna look up. Let's look up more famous. Let's look up more famous animals. <laughs> Working animals. <laughs> oh, I it's, love little It's creatures. having me look up you know truffle hogs. You know what one hog. of my favorite f animals that got famous was? Mm. Is the sheep that hid so it wouldn't get shoes. I will never go to Florida, but thank you, Nero. <laughs> um, the, the sheep that refused to be sheared for years on end. And it was just like a mass of wool. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> I think people put out, like, rewards for who could capture and shear it. Yeah. If that's the one I'm thinking of. I think they finally caught it after several um, decades. His name was Shrek. Yeah! <laughs> uh, Shrek was. was a merino weather sheep uh, belonging to Bendigo Station in New Zealand. Uh, he gained international fame in 2004 after he avoided being caught and shorn for six years. Shrek hid in caves... <laughs> Avoiding muster. Um, the shearing was broadcast on national television in New Zealand. His fleece contained enough wool to make 20 large men's suits wearing, uh, weighing 60 pounds. So he was just excellent. running around with 60 pounds of wool on him. Oh my god. Uh, that's bonkers. 
I mean, there's an anthology idea. True animal stories of like singular animal protagonists. <laughs> I also like there was recent, uh, like a decade ago, there was a news clipping um, about what some suburb of Portland where a goat was on the roof of someone's house and no one could get him down. Oh, yeah. And the neighbor was like, that goat only respects one man. Yep. And they had to wait for the goat's owner to come down, come home from work and order the goat to get down. <laughs> I just There's... love that headline, goat only respects one man. There's another sheep uh, that has his own Wikipedia article named Chris, who also <laughs> Chris uh, was sheep. a Marino Ram. <laughs> Sorry uh, for who... laughing so loud. Who became famous for being shorn uh, a record run Manival in Canberra? <laughs> he, let me see. Um, he his fleece said world oh, shoot, record. What time is it? Beating previous records held by sheep like Sh Shrek, um, ninety one pounds. But okay. the length of the fleece meant it had no commercial value. Incredible. This 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 picture is killing me. This picture of Chris. I'm putting this in the chat too. Something about this shape is extremely pleasing to me. He's his shape is like he looks like those fucking slimes from Dragon Quest. Like he's like teardrop shaped. It's beautiful. Um, speaking of Shrek, uh, the Puss in Boots movie is way better than it has any right to be. That's what I hear. I will say I it has, it's better than it has any right to be. I just, I get, I will say, um, I feel like there is, I feel like there's going to be a Puss in Boots, uh, what's a, a, a backlash in a few months or people are like, was it really that good? Because everyone's hyping it so much. It's very good. But like, that's, that's why I just say it's very good. For yes. A spin off of a Shrek. Movie. Yeah. I think like um, people are just so hungry for good, sh good animation that like this one, like, yes, it is good, but I worry there's going to be a, a backlash in a few months. Where people are like, it's not that good. And I'm like, it's yes, we know, but we're hungry. We know it's not that good, but we're hungry and it's nice to have a good thing. <clears throat> I just don't want to like overhype it. You know what I mean? You, you get yeah. worried I, about that kind of I thing. I also, um, I did like it a lot. People have asked me my thoughts on the wolf in it, including you, Amanda. Um, and wolf's okay. I um, love that wolf. I, the wolf makes me think of someone took a screenshot of a Twitter timeline where someone was like man these animation studios are putting in the laziest most basic ass bitch wolf designs in their movies and fl furries are flipping their shit anyway oh and i then, love like, that design tweet, and then the tweet right under it was someone flipping their shit for the wolf and um uh puss in boots oh i fucking I love that design above it was someone flipping their shit for the wolf and um bad guys um and um, I just think, like, that's really funny. Um, I think, like, the design's good. I just don't think it's anything special. Um, I love how weird um, Jack Horner's design is. Oh, that's I'm a great design. I'm much more intrigued by that monstrosity. Um, I love that he's, and... like, I got baby features. Yeah, he has, like, the skinny little legs holding up a giant torso, and... <clears throat> He's got, like, the baby teeth, too, the way they're, like, sized mm -hmm. and arranged. It's very interesting. The strange baby man who is evil. Yeah, he's a strange baby man. Um, and I'm, I'm way more intrigued by that character design. I think I don't um, care about the wolf's design on paper. I think it just works really good in application. Yeah, no, like, I, I agree with you there that it's it's an application thing, but, like, the wolf design on its own is nothing special. I, I, um, okay. I've seen a lot of wolves. In I know, and you um, showed me a lot of wolves, and I didn't think they were very special, so I'm not, I guess he, this is, I think, the point where it comes to being a wolf connoisseur, 
and you can like tell the differences between all the wolves. Whereas me, it's like I thought all the wolves I've seen before weren't that interesting, and this is a much more interesting wolf. I think I, I think this is a I am not I do not have a refined wolf taste thing so I like Twinkies. I feel like the voice makes the wolf character more than the design for me. But yeah, that's part of the character um, though. But that's not the character design. Yeah, but I'm talking when I was asking your impressions, I was asking the character as a whole. Yeah, but I hadn't seen the movie by then. Oh, um, okay. Which which is why I, I said no comment cuz I haven't seen the movie. Yeah. Um uh I um I do like a lot of little details in the movie. Um they they do a lot of the good like subtle symbolism things that I, I dig. Um like when the wolf first shows up, Puss has drunk eight glasses of milk and the wolf stops him from drinking the ninth. I just like that the milk had like a hand drawn effect when it was spilling. Yeah. It's a very pretty movie. Like, I was like, that milk is 2D animated. I'm here for it. I found... Um, a wood. I ahead. also... I really like the little dog character that's voiced by Corey's Blorbo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gillum, is that his last name? Gillum? Um, Gian. Gian, okay. I always forget his last name, which is why it's like, he's just... He's Corey's Blorbo. Um, yeah. <laughs> I found a uh, Wikipedia article about famous animals and I found a subcategory about oracular animals which is animals that predict things uh, this includes that octopus that predicted soccer matches but I'm learning about a bunch of new animals such as Mr. Nuts the tuxedo cat <laughs> he uh in 2012, apparently got famous for predicting the American presidential election. Um, but apparently he's also famous for having very prominent testicles. <laughs> this cat is no longer alive. Damn, why couldn't that be me? Hang God on. damn, I, I have it's to not look fair. Up, I, have, I have to look up Mr. Nuts. because this, this is a Mr. Nuts! Yeah, Mr. Nuts the cat. I need to Mr. see what these Nuts testicles look the like. Cat. I need to see what this his situation is. Mr. Nuts the cat. Where are these nuts? There's also a uh, a parakeet named Manny who lives in Singapore. He is a working parakeet uh, in as an astrology assistant. There are no this pictures is apparently a really of his common nuts. Thing. I'm I'm trying to find pictures of his nuts. I think I need to do some more refined searching, but I was I was think I was looking at Manny the the astrologer parakeet. Apparently, oh, um, this is like a common thing. There was a tweet I saw recently about a cat who I think is like the the highest rated um, tourist destination in Poland. Mm -hmm. It's just a fat cat, and everyone just rates it so highly that it's the high. Who has he has a little house? <laughs> Listen, if you're going to see a fat cat, I'm sure that he doesn't disappoint. Yeah, I like seeing I like seeing a fat cat. I have a uh, my friend Lauren has a cat named Bert who is <clears throat> not fat looking necessarily, but he's very dense. Like he is Love three times cat. the mass of my cat Bubby, and I've got every time I go over to their house and I watch him jump from the top of his cat tree mm -hmm. with like an audible thud. I love a cat that is dense enough to headbutt you and knock you over. I've yeah, met a few of those, and it's like, holy shit. Boy. This is a dense man. Like, like, like the kind of cat that just doesn't have a neck. It's just head attached to shoulders, and then they headbutt you, and you die. Love those <laughs> kind of cats. Yeah, there's some good cats out there. Was the cat that named, I think, Mr. Tibbles, who, like, a limit like extincted an entire bird species is that a true story or like a myth that's news to me let me look it up i think it was mr tibbles cat extinct unless i'm thinking of the name story of tibbles a pet cat that okay here it is mr tibbs that's what it is um 
Story of Tibbles, a pet cat that allegedly rendered a bird species extinct in less than a year. Jesus. According to All About Birds, uh, Tibbles was the first cat to set... Oh, shit! Oh, my God, I just opened a website and it started auto-playing music and scared the crap out of me. Never mind. Never mind. Oh, God. How Tibbles the cat killed a rare species. If this website plays a video, I'm going to be mad. New Zealand has some... Oh, yeah, it was in New Zealand. Um, okay. That makes that sense. Tracks. It was the Lyles Wren, a little uh, flightless bird. Um, David Lyle, Stephen Islands, it was named after him. The birds were first spotted by assistant lighthouse keeper David Lyle, and they were named after him. His cat Tibbles used to bring him carcasses of the birds that no one knew existed until then. <laughs> so this cat... Extinct, apparently extincted a unknown species of bird all by himself. Oh, Tibbles, you monster. It, it makes sense that it was in New Zealand. Yeah. They're not prepared for cats. No, they are no. not. They were not ready for Tibbles. No, no. It, oh. <laughs> Sorry, I just witnessed a rat dangle and then plummet from a hammock. <laughs> Little idiots, I love them. Uh, I, I still think about this one convention I was at when someone had a secret rat and they were just like, hey, check this out. <laughs> it's like, rat. If I were living in a place with undiscovered bird species, I think I would keep... I think cats should be indoors in general, everywhere. Yeah. Cats shouldn't be outside. I mean, I think most, they're a danger to most yeah. birds. And also, <coughs> what is the, I forget the statistics of how sh much shorter their lives are when they live outside. But it's not good. They're a danger to themselves and others. Much um, like myself. Yeah, they go, it goes down from like, one, uh, their, their life expectancy goes down from like 20 years to 12 years. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well. It's not good for them. They get in a fight, they get hit by cars, they get diseases that they would never get exposed to. They eat things they shouldn't. Yeah, my, my, my cat would not last. And America week is a, a lot more um, firmer on keep your cats inside than um, I think Europe is. Um, and ah, that depends on where you live. Well, like People like um, even the people that are like keep your cats inside um, that I've met <coughs> that live in Europe are more like it's better for them, but don't get too upset if someone is insistent on keeping their cat as an outdoor cat. I, I feel see. like Americans get more upset over it, um, and that's partly because we have coyotes which will eat your cat. Um, mm -hmm. Again, so it's definitely depends on where you more are. More dangerous, yeah. Like um, Texas doesn't like we have some problems with that, but like not really. <gasps> it depends on where you are, and so like your cats are usually the most dangerous thing in Texas. Mm -hmm. Again, depending on where you are. Again, Texas is one of, it's, it's, America it's is ridiculous. already a huge country and that throws people off. And Texas is a huge state. So, like, you can say I something. I forget who told me this, but um, someone, like, shared a story about a guy talking about his cats, his kids were upset because the cats kept getting eaten by Oh, that was a, that was a, a, a tweet. Okay. And their reply was, Sounds like you're just buying expensive coyote food. Um, and then his daughter cried. Yeah. Yeah, the tweet was this person talking to their neighbor and like, yeah, I have outdoor cats, but they keep disappearing. So we just go out and get a new one and it disappears too. And then the person tweeting is like, it sounds like you're just feeding cats to the coyotes. And then the person's daughter was like, Bleh. I mean, yeah, that's that's what it is. Yeah, that's true. There are foxes in the UK, and they 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 will kill a cat. Yeah, mm -hmm. we have foxes here in in Minnesota. Oh. I've seen exactly one. I remember very distinctly. I was last fall. Yeah, I think it was last fall. 
I was at my kitchen table working on something and I just looked out onto my driveway and there was just a fox just staring at me. It was very unsettling. I'd never quite uh, seen a fox in real life before. We have coyotes too, but like I've, I've seen those from growing up in Southern California. Foxes are like their own thing. Blue, was I the one that was, were you the one I was showing the difference between wolves and coyotes too? Yes. Yeah, you did. Cause the, that was the one where like wolf ears are like way smaller than you would think. Proportionally. Yeah. Like Pro if you're used to seeing a dog. Yeah. And, um, their snouts are bigger proportionally than you would think. Mm hmm. Um, Yeah, there's like a bunch of like, like differences between animals that I never think about until I see them. Like the, the difference between rabbits and hares is also like weird, like because they're almost similar looking, but like there's enough fundamental differences that frankly is really like uh, unflattering on the hares uh, part. Like hares look so weird compared to rabbits. There's they're like stretched out. Yeah, they, they look like they an alien put on a rabbit suit wrong. I'm gonna look at it. Yeah, it's the it's not that they look bad when you look at them, like their ears are cute, but they just like their eyes are like too intelligent. It's like un upsetting to look at. <laughs> oh, that just made me think oh. oh, I got to see my favorite dog at Emerald City Comic Con. Peach. Oh, Pinch, the most Pinch beautiful the creature. Chihuahua. That's a dog. That's a dog. That's a... I was so upset I didn't get to say I didn't get to see him on the last day. <laughs> yeah, me neither. But yeah, she's cute with her little tongue sticking out. Oh, bless her. Um, there was a cosplaying dog that I saw. At this Emerald City, kind of saw last yeah, Emerald City, that I also saw at San Diego. Um, and um, what's has anyone here played Final Fantasy VIII? No. Mm -mm. Um, so the princess character in Final Fantasy VIII has a dog. Like, so her special move is like she does something with her dog. Um, and so the owner of this dog um, dresses up as the princess from Final Fantasy VIII. And it's the same breed as um, a dog in Final Fantasy VIII. So it's dressed, they're like together, um, a little cosplay for those Final Fantasy VIII characters. Uh, and I've seen them at multiple shows. And the dog is exceedingly patient and will pose for you if you ask for a picture. Um, I have a picture of this dog in its little booties wearing sunglasses. Um, it's a very good dog. That's a very cute sounding dog. Yeah, no, Pinch is cute. Uh, I'm trying to think if there were any other, like, good costumes or anything. I got to explain to some people today uh, of some of the, the most common or the most popular ones I saw. Oh, this oh, past I got a year. photo. I forgot to post it, but someone did, like, the, the Emperor Palpatine Kermit frog meme. <laughs> I missed that. That was so Damn. good. Yeah, I'll have good. to tweet that when this is over. Very good. I <sighs> saw a group that was uh, dressed as um, the cast of Legally Blonde, complete with a UPS guy. That was fun. Good. I really wish um, I could have gotten a video of uh, me doing the oh, and snap. I learned dude. about the fucking um, what's the the, the pirate the gay pirate show? Oh, uh, our, flag our flag means, means death. death. Yeah, I learned about the orange shirts. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't know I that. And I was like, why are there so many people wearing this blue shirt with the oranges? It's a very nice shirt. And then someone finally told me and I was like, oh, my God, I've been losing my goddamn mind. That was me last Emerald City in August is when I started seeing them really crop up. And I had to have someone explain it to me, too. I saw I saw the show. I, I understand the motif. But I totally it flew over my head until someone explained that until they get like real merch. They've been like co-opting the same like orange pattern shirt. Isn't it from, the, from Gap. the Gap? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like from the Gap or something, which is hilarious because I literally like two months earlier had an orange shirt like to wear as part of my wedding outfit. 
Oh yeah, that, yeah, like, you did. Poshmarked. Yeah, and I poshmarked that shirt like a year ago, and I could not find like a good shirt for a long time. And now all of a sudden they're all over the place. <clears throat> Amazing. Nero's in the chat like, oh, I just got it. Um, yeah, because I yeah. saw, like, some people were in costumes, but a lot of people just wearing the shirt. And I'm like, this is a very, very nice shirt. I do like the shirt. So if you to, to people who are obviously didn't see it, it's a button-up short sleeve shirt. It's a lovely blue, and it just has an or oranges on it, just a pattern with the nicely rendered oranges all over it. Very nice shirt. And it was everywhere. Like, people casually wearing it. And apparently it's, like, unofficially adopted fan clothes for Our Flag Means Death. Mm hmm Yeah, it's, like, the thing that you can buy to to signal your your group allegiances. It was a lot of that, and it was a lot of people trying to recreate the the breakup robe, I think it was. Like I saw a lot of the wears. robes. Some of them looked yeah. so comfortable. I'm like, and I asked a few, like, do you wear that at home when you're not cosplaying? And they were like, yes. <laughs> Chris saying I was ahead of my time. I literally, like, so my, my wedding was, like, orange-themed because my wife, who speaks Spanish, uh, informed me that there's an expression in Spanish that is media naranja, which is orange half, which they use the way we use better half. And that's Aww. literally the entire premise but now, am I gonna like have to explain that this was not like my cringe fail "Our Flag Means Death" gay wedding <laughs> in the year of twenty twenty two in an art museum? Yeah, you goddamn nerd. The nerd hole just gets deeper and deeper. <laughs> it's like no, no, I'm not this uh, dorky. I swear, I'm very dorky, but I'm not that dorky. And again, th this this was like after Sarah had to like almost like explicitly veto like some Pacific Rim cake toppers or something. <laughs> oh, I would have loved that. I mean, it wouldn't have been my wedding. It's not my call to make, but I would have supported you, Blue. Yeah. Especially I, I, if um, it was the Russian one. We're, we're another, no, we're drift compatible. We're the scientists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, another friend of mine, their cake toppers were a Bulbasaur and an Eevee that they gave, like, a bridal veil and a bow tie to. That's cute. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my fucking maid of honor is owning my ass in the chat. <laughs> Get him! Get him! Get him! Get him! I joked about it on Twitter, but now the more I joke about it, the more I want it to be real. If I ever got married again... Um, mm -hmm. I want a, a Nickelodeon Double Dare-themed wedding. Can you describe what that would be like? Because I'm familiar with it, but I'm trying well, to think of... What would that look like, Amanda? Vanilla pudding dyed green to be slime, and there'd be several opportunities to slime people. Mm -hmm. um, you have to get the ring out of an obstacle course. Um, that's themed after food. The <laughs> cake, I think... Maybe you have to stick your hand up the giant nose to get the ring. I was going to say, there needs to be a giant nose or a giant yes. ear somewhere in here. Maybe there's a giant nose you have to stick your hand up to get one of the rings. The other ring you have to get out of, like, a giant peanut butter jelly sandwich. Everybody needs to be wearing the helmets and those, like, really visible, yes. like, mouth guards that everybody had to wear. Yes. Um, someone you know, needs to be um... commentating it the entire time. And the winner um, gets the gack. Um, and I guess that's, you do your vows, you exchange the rings, and you get the rings, and you get gacked. Yeah, we um, had Mark Summers to officiate. What's that dude been let, to I, lately? No, no, leave him be. I, he actually had to, like, do, like, what was it? Uh, behavioral therapy something something. Just, like, no, he's, I'm not, would never suggest that, jet, yes, jet that like man. Yes, like, extreme germophobia something like oh, I, I didn't know if that was an urban legend or not no did it's he really? true he actually goes to like oh, talks damn. about it and he is he kind of did some cognitive behavioral therapy that was what i was trying to think of mm. and has kind of like worked through it but like no i would not trouble the poor man to relive like he did do some commentary on the reboots of double dare that was a few years ago um but he did not get in the in in the thick of it does he have the germophobia because of Double Dare? No, no, he had it pre-exist. No, 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 he had it pre-existing, and he's kind of 
powered through it to be on Double Dare. Yeah, Wikipedia tells me that he is OCD. Yeah. At least he, he has said publicly he is OCD. Yeah, so Spe- it, he kind of powered through it. and Yeah. I would Speaking not... Speaking of... Yes. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. I, I'll just keep talking about making I, giant one, tongues. One cosplay that I appreciate continues, and I see at, like, a bunch of cons. Like, I always see at least one or two is people cosplaying as Legend of the Hidden Temple contestants. <laughs> yes, I always see at least one couple That's so as good. like purple parrots or blue barracudas or something. That This is yeah. a conversation Mel and I were having uh, was which like costumes were not like from something that was like new or, you know, particularly culturally relevant, but is consistently showing up every show. We saw a lot of Sophie and Howells, which we thought were pretty interesting. A couple of uh, the Pine siblings. Um, yeah, I always see a Legends of the Hidden Temple con- competitors. And speaking of, like, Nickelodeon game shows, um, Mel informed me when we were talking about Gideon the Ninth, they strongly recommended the audiobooks. And I was like, oh, do you happen to know who... Uh, who uh, narrates them, and they were like Moira Quirk. Do you remember Moira Quirk? No. She was the referee in Nickelodeon Global Guts. Did you ever watch that? I guess it was Guts, no. but I always think of the one of gl- the global version where they there's like always a kid from Mexico and always a kid from Israel. Um, it was the the where the aggro crag comes from, like three kids. Uh, from three countries in Global Guts case. They do a bunch of like Nickelodeon ass physical challenges. And then the final one is always they have to climb up the aggro crag, which is like a massive structure of like pipes and like blocks and dry ice. And they have to get to the top first. But yeah, Moira Quirk is like a very distinct voice. I think she did some voice acting later for some cartoons or something. But yeah, I, I that was like a, a piece of knowledge that I did not realize I had retained was Moira Quirk, the, the Global Guts referee, who's apparently reading Necromancer, Space Necromancer books now. Um, I um I did see a Vegeta Badman shirt. Oh, that's good. <laughs> oh, I, like, yeah, one of my like prized possession is my... player in the Badman. One of my prized um, possession is my Badman uh, uh, enamel pin. Oh, I remember those. Those are those are pretty good. Um, let me think. What were this, were there any other like? Uh, did you see the disco costumes? turtles? Yes, I did with April O'Neil. Oh yeah, yeah, had, yeah, like, yeah. The, the sparkly disco ball microphone. The, yes. And yeah, and the 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 Casey Jones that was dressed like Casey in the Sunshine Band. Um, <laughs> oh, that I that went over my head till just now. Let me um, think. Yeah, and the, there was a shredder and a bebop and a rock steady with them, um, and they were like '70s early punk people, um, I guess, to fight the uh, um, like they they were kind of like dressed like the Ramones to be the counterpoint to the the disco turtles. <laughs> um, there was also I'm to think. I saw a I saw... lot of good. Everything Everywhere All at Once cosplayers. Yes, yeah, there were lots of uh, the Everything Bagel uh, costumes that were done excellently. I and saw I, a couple. Well, I also saw Jobo with her like Elvisy outfit. Um, oh, I think I missed that one. That was and, good. Uh, yeah, was dressed I as Jamie a Lee Curtis. It, it was yeah. yeah someone, it was um, it was a couple, and so the girl was dressed in the Elvisy outfit of Jobo, and the guy was dressed as Jamie Lee Curtis's character. Um. <laughs> There were a few people dressed up as a uh, witch hat atelier character. Oh, those were, were always... so good. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I, I talked to a few of them because they all, uh, nearly all of them made their own yeah. costumes. And like in the case of one, someone was dressed as Coco and they had like gotten all of the stitching exactly right. Even in the parts of the costume like that you wouldn't be able to see like with everything on, on top of it. I was like so impressed. <laughs> that was amazing. There was also um, a really good uh, way of the house husband um, <laughs> cosplayer that I took a picture of. Um, Let's see, Nero, uh, can you think of any uh, costumes that really stood out to you from <laughs> Emerald City? Oh, they, he talked to that Coco. Yeah. Where's 
Yeah, Chris, if you could have seen this this Coco, it was unreal. There's also I'm trying to remember which girl it was with like the, it's either T- Tisha or Riche. I forget which one. Uh, those were always really impressive. Mm. I'm gonna call Spike's bluff. I'm I made a joke, but then I said I made it. Then I said no, I'm real about this. And then Spike said, "Dare you?" So I'm going to make my Iron Circus themed maid costume for C2E2. Yeah, you really should. Um, I really think that would be amazing. It's I'm gonna it's gonna be a one woman made cafe, but we only sell comics. <laughs> I thought I it's, I have um, the I, idea in my head. I'm talking to a friend right now to get gear like little decorative gears 3D printed for it. This wasn't at Emerald City. This was at Rose City last year. There was a Boba Fett, but like Boba T Fett. Um, so he was Boba Fett, but themed to look like Boba T. I I see. Um, it's very good. <laughs> uh, I want ice cream. <laughs> I want ice cream. Okay. I'm going to cry. I, I have some Girl Scout cookies in the other room. No! Want after this. And I have like... Did the Girl a- Scouts try to sell to you? What? They did not sell di- directly to me, uh, but Sarah, uh, my wife, ordered uh, them from me. Oh, a there were Girl Scouts, Girl Scouts at the show that came to our oh. table multiple times. Oh, oh I heard about those. I did not buy them. Cookies. They didn't come by yeah. my... Oh, I must have been distracted. I would have absolutely bought their cookies. No, I'm sad now. Depression. That's so, such, a, such a smart idea. Just Depression. getting into the con and selling them. I actually, uh, I actually I like the knockoff Samoas more than I like their Samoas. There's like a um, Keebler knockoff Samoas, and I think it's called Coconut mm-hmm. Dreams. I like those way mm. more than the Girl Scout ones. Uh, I also I saw some cosplayers dressed as the League of Their Own team. Yeah. Um, That's pretty good. Yeah, it was like a group of ladies that were together doing that. Um It'd be funny if they all came separate. <laughs> Almost all the witch hat Altier people were separate, and I think that that's neat. Yeah, they. All yeah, hey, guess what? There's like one thing. minute left on failure to launch. Fifty seconds. Forty nine. Forty eight. What um? What a uh, number are we at? Two thousand four hundred fifty four backers, and the uh, amount is sixty five thousand five hundred twenty out of the twenty thousand goal. Jeez. Okay. How many? Uh, how many artist bonuses is that? I don't know. Let me think. Um, okay. I don't for trouble. Every five thousand over twenty thousand. Um, every five thousand. So... Okay, so that's 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65. So I think that's nine artist bonuses. Yeah. Of of how much each? It's that's it's forty five thousand over so that means it's a 45 page rate increase dang all right i'm pretty happy with that um oh i also saw um a louis and claudia from the new interview with the vampire cosplayers mm-hmm. um, and it's done they, they even had the Yay. They, Yay. they even had the weird creepy contacts <laughs> i i Wish I had a soundboard. I wanted to do confetti so bad, but I'm tired. I'm gonna remember um, to set up a soundboard like the, sometime. I liked the. Did you see the drag orc? No, I did not see the drag orc. She had a rhinestone purse that was bag of holding. Um, <laughs> it's very good. Nice. Um, and we did it! Yay! Yay! Our book is funded. Very nicely over goal. The one thing oh, about not being on Kickstarter shy. anymore, we I wish there was a way to. dollars shy of another bonus. Oh, oh no! God. Oh well. Boo. Or, oh, no, well. my math is wrong. We weren't nine dollars shy. And oh. We were far off. I'm I'm tired. Okay. We're all tired. Say, bullshit. It is understandable. I wish we could see like a straight <laughs> graph of like when everybody pledged during the campaign, the way you used to be able to on kick track. Oh yeah. With kick track. Cool. Yeah. Um, like, I bet if you. The back to see. Yeah. The back yeah. end might have that. Maybe we can like be like, Spike, share it. Spike, let us see. 
Like that would be fun. I I I, I can't imagine it's too different from um from a typical Kickstarter stuff, but. I'm looking at the back end now. I can see the secrets. Um, yeah, they don't have a graph. That's that's a bummer. I would love a graph. I'll tell them that like, hey, can we have a graph? Wait, maybe I found the graph. Oh, you um, found a graph? So it's not a graph, but I can see a breakdown of what days got the most. Mm -hmm. And obviously the first day got the most. But, uh... Looks like we had a bump, like, kind of in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, hold on, I'm sending it to our chat. Let's take a look. Okay. Oh, yeah, interesting. I have tweeted. I'm I done tweeting. The, Goodbye. Um, I think the bump that we got on the 13th, that's when the article that interviewed H Bomber guy went up. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. <sighs> I can Yeah, it seems like there really wasn't any day or maybe only one or two where like nobody backed, but everybody like every nearly every day got at least something, which is mm -hmm. pretty nice. Yeah. That's not good. bad at all. Nope, nope. Pretty organic, I would say. Yeah. 7,000 on the last day is great. <laughs> Yay, I can now <coughs> retire and ignore the Twitter. Goodbye. I'm no longer man. Now ev everyone's going to get a free pin. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I designed, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was our last stretch goal is um the Yeah. Um everyone gets a free pin. Oh, did they share the design with everyone? Yeah, it's yeah, up there. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. So, Nero asks, wait, if this is the second highest crowdfunded I oh. answer in this book that is in the Smith uh, the Here's one. a thing though, um and Spike brings us up a lot and it's true. The, the monetary amounts are kind of different if you try to compare it to Kickstarter because Kickstarter didn't like compare because different they don't all contain uh, 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 what's it um, include shipping mm. yeah so like shipping that is throws a off the numbers substantially yeah so it, it it's harder to figure out and compare them so I'm sure if we ask Spike Spike could do some math and figure out what is the well um so I think um. Uh, I'm checking, um, the Iron Circus ones, um, I'm going to arrange them by most funded. Hold on. Um, Girls with Slingshot, so if we're not including Smut Peddlers and only counting comics, Cautionary Fables North America is the most funded and then Girls with Slingshots is the second most funded. Mm. Then they are all smut peddlers until real hero shit. Um, which was uh, funded at 86,797. Um, and that did not... We didn't include shipping on that one. So... Um, it is not the most funded, even if you uh, exclude smut pillars. Mm -hmm. um, because then after that, we get Crossroads at Midnight. 
So it's about comparable with Crossroads at Midnight. <laughs> so it'll be fourth um, most funded if you exclude Smut Peddlers and animation. Because mm -hmm. um, we were expecting it to do about what You Died did, and it definitely exceeded You Died. Um, you Died made 46000 Five hundred and forty-one, and that does have shipping, so it did do better there. Right so hooray! <clears throat> I want to eat something spicy, so bad. I'm dying, Squirtle. What kind of spicy food? <sighs> like a really good restaurant-style salsa. The green Ooh. stuff and the red stuff. Ugh. I've been trying to buy salsa locally, and it's all weird. It's all, like, extra tangy. Every time mm -hmm. I find, like, quote-unquote restaurant style and um, homemade style, it's all really tangy, which is weird. Hmm. And, you can uh, really make your own. I'm gonna. Uh, I've just been lazy. Sure. Like, I have my mom's recipe for a red salsa, which is really spicy and really good, and I just need to make it. <sighs> really nice. I've just been lazy. I'm like, well, surely this store-bought salsa will satisfy me. No. No, it did not. <sighs> when will I learn? I'm not in Texas anymore, which is good. Yeah. But I am missing, I am definitely missing food. Yeah, you're not getting that that Tex Mex. Mm -mm. I definitely uh, am glad I got dim sum while I could in <laughs> Seattle. There's that like was one good. nice place. Yeah, that was really good. That was, I'd never like had one, dim sum before. That was so fucking good. There's one I, nice place in the cities that's like in a suburb, but that's really the only one I found here that there's, does a good dim sum. There's a place nearby that does pretty okay Tex Mex. It's. It's like the kind of stuff you eat when you're drunk. You know what I mean? It's good. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's just not good. It's it's you you eat this while drinking after work. Hmm. If that makes sense. Um, the, mm -hmm. the dim sum place we went was great. I loved it. Oh, it was so good. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, like, even though my like... food was a little contaminated. <laughs> yeah. Look, Perfect. it was worth it. It was worth it. So uh, I, I mentioned before, I have a shellfish allergy, so I can't eat shellfish. And I was very careful not to eat certain things because I had to be like, does this have shellfish? Does this? And there's all these things on the table and like nothing's labeled. I'm like, OK. And I think something I ate got contaminated because after that uh, dinner, I was like, I'm going to camp out in the hotel lobby bathroom because things are going to happen that I refuse to subject my poor roommates to. Mm hmm. So I just lived down there for a little while. It was fine. It was worth I had it. To, like bring you a key. Yeah, just like slid me a key. It's like thank you. <laughs> it was worth it though, a hundred percent. I would do it again in a heartbeat. I don't care. Yeah. Um. It was worth my right stomach life. going to shit. The range of stuff we got to eat uh, with the number of people there was was amazing. Um. I'm bummed that I was so tired I had to leave early. I, I would have <laughs> liked to continue to we didn't my face. I was, we didn't stay that much later. No. I, I was just dead on my feet. and I took a lot of those menu. buns uh, home with me, and that was my lunch the next day. You should have stolen your buns. Um, well, I wouldn't have let you. So no, nah. there were only three. I in there were mine. love the white fluffy pork buns. Um, I, I like those cus those it. egg things. I like egg custard thingy. I wish I remembered what it was yeah. called. There's surely there's got to be a dim sum place around here that I'm really fortunate. Oh, there is. There is. There's a really good one that I went to. Basically, every single C two E two I went there. Oh. Um, uh, I know that it delivers to Spike's house. Um, I live but, uh, about a, on a good day, a twelve minute drive from where Spike is, maybe fifteen. So, well, when you're in their office, you can definitely get it delivered. Um, but yeah, um, I would need to look up the name. I'll probably just I, go I, in I, person. I like, well, like it's one of those places where I remember it when I see it, um, ah. but I can never remember the name. Uh, 
but yeah, I um, have frequently, like, whenever I go to C2E2, my plan is to eat there as much as possible. I am so excited um, about C2E2 because this is the first time I've lived... Ah! Uh, sorry, that was a Slack notification. Sorry if y'all heard it. Let me... No, it's... Um, I didn't hear it. No, no, no. People listening. Um, 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 um. It, it picks up my desktop audio, so let me pause notifications for a while. So people watching us probably heard my Slack notification. So sorry about that. But yeah, I'm excited because this is the first time I've lived in a city that a convention is happening. So it's like, oh my god. It's like, the convention hall is a 12-minute drive from my apartment. Mm-hmm. I'm so excited. I don't have to fly anywhere. I can just drive my stuff over and drop and, it off. Um, I can yeah, sleep and- in my own bed? What? Amanda, um, the dim sum place that I really like is like Chinatown is like a 10 minute walk from the convention center. Um, so that's great. Stuff your face with dim sum. God, I love dim sum. Love it too. I want it in my face mm. right now. Mm. I want something spicy. I need it. I need, I want my lemon flavored Girl Scout cookie. <laughs> We're all suffering. We're suffering. Truly. Though, mm-hmm. I am looking forward to being able to like bring friends to touch, like come to my place, leave C2E2, <coughs> touch my vermin. Yeah. I'll be, I, I'm, I'm going to come to cake. So, Ooh. uh, yeah, I should. I, I want to visit you while I'm Yay, in town. Yay, touch cake, my vermin. Which I think is the first week of June, if I'm remembering correctly. <laughs> I want to. I want to hold your rat. I want your rat to groom me and clean my ear or whatever it is that rats do. Uh, they probably won't clean your ear, but if. I've never let them do this, but they always want to. They will clean your teeth. They want, yeah, <laughs> no, no. Right. I don't let them do it. Every bloom, every now and then, I will hold one and get kind of and get distracted, and they'll be like, "Oh, your mouth's open." I'm like, "No, no, don't you fucking dare!" I've seen people on YouTube like let the rats do it, and I'm like, "You nasty bastards! Absolutely not! I love these little goblins, but they no, not in my mouth." Ugh. But no, I'm just saying, they probably won't groom your ears. Uh, they might groom your hair. Uh, definitely your fingers, um, your fingernails. If you have touched anything, it doesn't even have to be food. It can be a book. It can be lotion. It can be just any smell that's not usual. They will clean under your nails. Oh, they're ridiculous. Yes, Nero, nasty. Nasty, absolutely. Ugh, ugh, creatures. At least they don't steal my nose ring. My other babies used to try to steal my nose ring and run away with it. But so far, the new ones haven't tried to do that. That was always harrowing when a rat's like, ooh, what's this? I'm going to take it. I'm like, no, it's attached. Please. Don't do that. Okay, well, we have been on... It's been two hours. I'm so tired. I messed that sandwich up yeah. as it was... I just said sandwich. <laughs> like, sent his sandwich. <sighs> we need to go to bed. Yeah. I'm gonna let myself have one more cookie before I... Yeah. Again. Yeah. You were talking for a while. We were all talking for yeah. a while. It was fun. Um, I just I wish we were more high energy. We were just... Oh, cool. Which one? Is it the, the Elgato? Uh, I think so. I don't have to look it up. I rem- I forget. It is a nice one, and I did get um, an arm with nice. it. Nice. Um, so, um, the thing is, is that <laughs> my desk isn't really good for hooking an arm. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I have the little table ah. that's on top of my desk. Yeah. Um, that my scanner lives on, and I think I'm gonna attach the arm to that. Nice arms are um, real good. The boom arms. Yeah, my rats would try. I, I say try to steal my nose ring because again, it's a hoop, so it is. There's no way to get it off without like pliers. 
So they would try to grab it and go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave with this. And I'm like, well, no, you're not. You little shit. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, we are very like this. Sh- I w- ideally, this would have been a high energy. Yay. The, 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 the funding is ending. Countdown. We but we are all so fucking tired. <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like that con really knocks your shit right into the dirt. Yeah. Plus it's not like we had to like clap to bring the Kickstarter yeah. back to life like it's, Tinkerbell. It's just nice when you can like, yay, we did it. Hooray. But we're just all like, woo. Yay. <laughs> I miss the fireworks on the Kickstarter. I know. That, that's true. We, yeah. If we, if we had like a little like plug in. <laughs> We like need balloons blues or... or fireworks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we can wrap it up. Blue. Yeah. Tell them where to find your works, your things, your oh, doings. God. Well, um, if you don't know me uh, already, uh, you can know that I have a <laughs> online comic that I worked on for eight years called Oh Human Star that you can read for free at ohhumanstar.com. Um, my name is Blue Delaquani on virtually everything I use, including Twitter, Tumblr, Mastodon.art, <laughs> and Pillowfort. Uh, I believe that's all Blue Delaquani. Those are my uh, social media uh, platforms of choice. Um, I <laughs> have done many stories for anthologies for Iron Circus, and I am around. I've <laughs> feel free to reach out to me and ask me who my favorite virtues last reward character is or uh what i think about robots in general and i will have an opinion about them um all my shit's on comicdoll.com just go there same amanda lafrenay.com our links are actually in the description click click them <laughs> read click, click, click. We, we rest now. Good night. <laughs>